Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is a by-the-book episode, a conversation with Caitlin Shess on her book that was released last year called The Liturgy of Politics, Spiritual Formation for the Sake of Our Neighbor. And Caitlin is a staff writer at Christ in Pop Culture, and her writing has also appeared at Christianity Today, Relevant, and Fathom Magazine. She lives in Dallas, Texas at present, and as we will discuss on the show, is soon to be moving to the East Coast to begin a doctorate at Duke University. And so I'm very thankful to have Caitlin come onto the show. We're going to talk a little bit about politics. We're going to talk about the relationship and or intersection of politics with the life and the community um, of the church how sometimes Christians don't mesh politics and their Christian lives well, how the church is actually positioned and set up in the world to beautifully blend the two, and yet how we sometimes tend to identify our political situation only as it expresses itself in um, our Western 21st century American Ways and yet how the kingdom of God, as Caitlin will talk about and as we'll both discuss in this conversation, how the kingdom of God actually encourages us to broaden our spect our uh, our our spectrum much bigger and to realize that when people from every tribe, language, people, and nation are gathering together, um, it challenges those individualistic ways that we tend to look at our own lives and the lives of the world. And so I'm excited for this conversation that Caitlin and I have, and I think that you will be encouraged by it. And so let's just jump right in to a conversation about the liturgy of politics. So Caitlin, it's really great to have you on the show. I'm thankful for you to agree to to, to talk with us today for a little bit. Of course. Thanks for asking me. Yeah. So, uh, Caitlin, I'm not sure if you know, but I I listened to the Holy Post podcast uh, several months ago. (laughs) And when Phil was talking you up one day about your book and then just listening to some of your comments, specifically about what you think the church could or should be doing in these times, and then you talked a little bit about your book, I just I went straight on Amazon and bought it after that. So you, you <laughs> gave yourself some great promotion and you weren't doing it in a, in a, in a, in a prideful kind of way or anything like that. I've just really enjoyed um, hearing your perspectives on things. And so that's how I found you. Um, but for our listeners, the, the, the book that Caitlin has written it, I just want to talk about it a little bit today is the liturgy of politics, spiritual formation for the sake of our neighbor. And, um, Caitlin, you are definitely the youngest author that I have interviewed on my show. (laughs) So, um, and maybe that's a compliment. I'm not sure, but I would love for (laughs) you to tell us a little bit about yourself, um, some of your upbringing, just things that would help us get to know you. And then um, maybe through college, I know you're, you're in a master's program and a coming up PhD. I'd like to get into all that. Um, And then maybe where, you know, where and how your paths crossed with, with Phil and the Holy Post and just, just some of that to kind of bring us, bring us all onto the same page. Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, grew up kind of all over the place. I was a military kid and, um, you know, was born in North Dakota, but have no kind of relationship to that. (laughs) Um, and yeah, I was military family and, um, really grew up in the church as well. My mom was pretty constantly on staff at church and um, my parents were both faithful believers. I'm really thankful that even though there are things about my church experience growing up that I wish was different, I really did get to just learn from two faithful Christians um, the whole time I was growing up um, and larger outside our extended family as well. Some really incredible people. Um, and then when I was thinking about going to college, I was just really insistent that I go to a Christian school. Um, I'd gone to public school my whole life and I thought, okay, this is when I'll really learn about the Bible. And I think it's good to have an important foundation. But I also thought, you know, I want that for myself, but I'm not, you know, I don't think there was any world where I was going to go into ministry or doing anything in theology. I thought I was going to go to law school, but I wanted to go to a Christian school to just have a good background in that stuff. And 
Then I went to Liberty University in Virginia. And so kind of two parallel things happened there. I was really, you know, there at Liberty at a time where the political stuff was getting really heavy and really intense. Um, It was a very partisan environment and just a difficult place to be. I was learning things in my Bible classes, my theology classes that um, conflicted a lot with, we had a lot of just politicians and pundits come and speak constantly, and it really conflicted with the things they were saying. And so for someone who's in college and trying to figure things out, it really sparked a passion for me in trying to think about how Christians should think about politics. Um, And it also was, I think, the really early beginnings of my thinking about how we are formed spiritually um, by things other than just our corporate worship together. That's so powerful and important. But I was in an environment where there was so much political involvement that I saw shaping people in ways that they were really unaware of. Um, And so that part of the story is kind of long, but I kind of had my whole life turned upside down while I was there uh, vocationally as well and just realized I didn't really want to go to law school. I wanted to a little bit because I was a nerd, <laughs> but I didn't really have a good reason for wanting to practice law. And so didn't really know at first what I was going to do. And um, I had I knew a bunch of people that were going to seminary, barely knew what that word was, but I just kind of thought, okay, I know I want to keep studying scripture. I don't know what job that will lead to. I have no idea, (laughs) but I just want to keep studying the Bible and I want to do it in a place where it's not quite as politically involved as this place is. And so then I went to seminary at Dallas Theological Seminary um, in the fall of 2016. So that was another kind of element of my progressive understanding of what I really wanted to do vocationally because I started seminary in the real heat of the 2016 election and had great conversations on campus, amazing professors. I felt like we, a lot of us were really on the same page with certain things politically. I mean, there was a lot of conflict as well, but I just met a lot of people that I thought you are passionate about this too. And you see that there's a problem here. We need to do something about it. And yet there was very little conversation about what our role as ministers could look like in that. There was a lot of kind of hand wringing and frustration over the political situation But that didn't really translate into any of our classes in terms of practically, like, what does your role look like in the church? What should the church be doing when it comes to politics? How should you be ministering to your people in a way that's helpful? And I took a bunch of spiritual formation classes in the beginning of seminary and just became really convinced that that needed to be a part of the answer. And I was really just blessed to have professors that encouraged me, one who was like, hey, you really complained in class a lot that we didn't talk enough about politics. Do you want to do an independent study (laughs) on that? Um, And another one who, after a publisher reached out to me about writing the book, was like, hey, this is going to be really hard while you're in seminary. Do you want to do your internship with me? And I'll just let you write the book, give you some advice if it's, you know, occasionally helpful and just kind of let you work. And so I really had support here to just kind of keep asking some of those questions about where spiritual formation and political theology intersect. And looking back now, it's like, it makes so much sense (laughs) with the trajectory of my life that I would care about these things. Um, But I didn't know I would want to care about them professionally. Um, And so now I'm going to start my doctorate at Duke in the fall, really just because, you know, I'd like to teach, I'd like to do some things in the academy, but really more than that, I just went, I'm not done asking these questions. And I really want to do them in an environment where I can spend a sustained amount of time and study. And I can just read things that are really important, be around really smart people, ask a lot of questions, do a ton of research, um, and hopefully come out of that, regardless of what job I have, better able to serve the people of God with the things that I found. Yeah, that's really an amazing story. Um, have, do you have to select a focus for your PhD? Yeah, so the the program at Duke, it's actually the THD, and it is okay. um, really great because I get to have a primary concentration um, in systematic theology, and then I can do a secondary concentration in something completely different. And so I think the bulk of mine will actually be outside of the divinity school in political theory and history and things like that. Um, and what really got me so excited about this program was that integrative interdisciplinary element because... I really get to have a strong background in things that are not just systematic theology, which I want to read a ton more and be way more, you know, capable of interacting in that world. But I realized that if I wanted to do political theology, I needed to have some political theory, some history background as well. And again, the whole point of the program really was like, I don't know exactly what I will do (laughs) with this in the future, but I want to be better prepared to interact well with questions that unfortunately, I don't know that 
a lot of American Christians have interacted well with. Um, a lot of my application process was honestly influenced by reading uh, Mark Knoll's Scandal of the Evangelical Mind and really thinking, gosh, I'm not even really sure exactly what I want to do, but I think he's right about our problem. And so I don't want to contribute to that. If I want to keep being involved in these conversations around politics, I want to do it from a really, really informed uh, perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I've heard of Mark Knoll's book. I haven't read it yet, but I, I think I think That's that great. I probably should. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and you, you've you talked, Caitlin, a couple of times now just about, um, you know, here's areas of discussion that a lot of Christians and, and Christians obviously then in churches don't always know how to navigate. They don't always know how to bring together mm-hmm. political um, viewpoints or positions with their spiritual formation. And so again, for, for listeners on the podcast, that that's really the heart of your book is, is how do these mm-hmm. two things intersect? And so could you talk to us a little bit? I mean, again, feel free to be autobiographical or just totally technical, however you want to describe it. When you say political, what, what are you, what do you mean? Yeah. So, um, you know, when I first got kind of interested in these conversations, I definitely meant political pretty narrowly. Um, you know, it happened in the in the heat of the 2016 election. I was originally a political science major uh, in my undergrad. I was a policy debater, so I spent like all of college really caring about, you know, technical policy details. And I still really care about those things, but part of what really shifted when I started asking theological questions about these things was instead to say, well, for me to read Augustine or Aquinas, or for me to read people throughout the church church's history who are talking about this, I can't just think about politics in terms of, you know, a democratic state <laughs> that, you know, that I am in today. I have to think about politics more broadly because the whole system into which they were writing and thinking and, and interacting politically was so different. And so on one hand, just to be able to apply things throughout history, I have to think a little more broadly than just the narrow place that I've been in where I elect representatives and they vote on laws and I you know, care about what judges are appointed. And you know, there has to be something broader than that. But the other part of it really was just thinking there is so much in scripture that relates to politics. And yet we've really narrowed it down to like a handful of things, right? We'll talk about mm-hmm. Jesus saying, given to Caesar, what is Caesar's? We'll talk about Romans 13 when Paul's like, you know, submit to governing authorities. We might talk a little bit about Revelation, but, you know, we also kind of generally don't like talking about Revelation, so maybe not. Um, And we just don't, we don't have a, we don't have a robust theology of political involvement because we're looking for technical ways that scripture addresses it. And there aren't that many. Um, Instead, I really wanted to, to look at scripture and think, I'm looking for places where there is instructions for God's people in how to live a common life with others. And that is throughout you know, the whole of scripture, even from the very beginning in the garden of ruling and reigning over creation to be God's representatives, to seek the flourishing of the community that you're in. Um, and then it's at the very beginning of God's people, right? Like some of the first things that God says to Abraham is like, yes, I'm going to bless you. Yes, I have this nation in mind. But also from the very beginning to bless other nations, like the the orientation has always been outward and it has always had something to do with communal life. And so for us to really take seriously what scripture says about those things, I think means we have to think about what that means for our communities in terms of our churches, but we also have to think about what that means in terms of the larger communities that we live in that are inevitably impacted by things like policies and elected officials and judges and things like that. And so when I use the word political, especially in the book, but I'm learning, I'm kind of trying to change my automatic way of using it, but it's a hard thing to unlearn. But the way I tend to use it is just to mean anything that has to do with our common life together. Um, and there's a line from Luke Brotherton's book, Christ in the Common Life, that I love and I quote it all the time. Um, it's about how he's basically defining politics as the making and shaping and forming of our common life together. And so there's elements of that that include laws and elected officials, because obviously the laws shape the way that we interact with each other. But then there's um, forming and norming of our common life together. So things like what culture props up those laws? You know, are we really going to obey them if there isn't a culture that's sustaining them? Okay, well, that's a whole other element of political life that isn't just who I vote for. That's, am I having conversations with people who are very different from me? Am I involved in institutions other than the government in my common life? You know, do I 
volunteer at the community center? Do I have relationships with people in my neighborhood? You know, all of those other things that are broader than what we typically define as politics. And yet they're not so separated as we might think that they are. You know, we are shaped by our whole common lives together. And then we take all of that into the, the voting booth with us. Um, and that includes the convictions we learn in church. That includes the relationships we have with our neighbors, the schools we send our kids to, the grocery stores we shop at. All of those things form our common life together. And when we split it up into here's what counts as political and here's what doesn't, first of all, that that kind of splitting up that decision tends to be motivated by kind of wanting to keep certain things in and out. But also we just miss some of the really important things that scripture could be teaching us about how we should be living our lives. Yeah, that's really good. And and I think there there are so many areas of our lives that I think we've just kind of assumed we are in the right camp or we've got the right view. Mm-hmm. Those things aren't, it, it's not not necessarily that we are stubbornly resistant to them. It's that we've kind of settled into a way of living where we don't expect scripture to challenge those kinds yeah. of things. Um, and, and a way I, I, I really like your, your definition, the common life with others. And, um, I had read several months ago, um, scandalous witness by Lee camp, mm. um, a little mm-hmm. political manifesto for Christians and his whole thing there helping us understand the difference between politics as we might discuss it, but it's that we get caught up in partisan politics. So we yeah. tend to think yeah. that various perspective, well, this is the clear truth here. And um, yeah, I've appreciated your ability to be very clear in what you're trying to say, um, because this gets mm. real fuzzy real quickly when we yeah. try to have these kinds of conversations. Um, you said, I think it was your chapter three, let me, let me make sure I'm doing this. Yeah. Of this world you had a, a section here about these different gospels that that um, actually compete for our mm-hmm. ability to really hear what scripture is saying. And maybe it kind of goes back to these areas that we don't really expect would be challenged necessarily. Um, and I just wondered, I'll, I mean, I'll list them off here, but I wondered if maybe you could talk a little bit about them. Um, you have here the gospels of prosperity, patriotism, security, and supremacy. And um, would you mind taking just a couple minutes and walk us through just those for some who've not read your book before? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So part of the reason that I talk about these as gospels is because we tend to, when we're talking about politics, have a divide between kind of my fundamental convictions about the world, right? I'm a Christian. So I believe God is real, Jesus Christ, you know, was born of a virgin and died and was resurrected. And and there, then those are kind of ultimate claims about my life. And then I have all of these political opinions that are kind of secondary to all of those things. And on some level, that's probably true. And on some level, that's probably good. And yet we often underestimate the extent to which those political opinions will worm their way into those list of more f- foundational fundamental beliefs that we have um, because they're powerful and because they're stories. And so I wanted to talk about them as gospels because the way they work out politically isn't just a list of propositional information that I kind of go, okay, well, these are the political beliefs I have. I'll go to the voting booth and I'll just kind of check the right things in my ballot. Instead, they're communicated to us as affective stories, as stories that pull on our emotions, that are really visceral and often visual and emotional. And so those are the kinds of stories that have the power to move from that secondary position to that primary position without us even realizing it. Um, And so these four gospels are not an exhaustive list. Um, They're not even exhaustive of political gospels. Um, For me, they were just ones that I both see happening on honestly both the right and the left but also that just are particularly pertinent for American Christians because of our own history. And I do a little bit of that in the beginning of the book, but there are much better people you could read on some of that kind of political history of American Christians, especially evangelicals. And so these are ones that are particularly difficult for us. The prosperity one um, is one that a lot of the people that I talk to tend to say like, oh, that's, that's not me. You know, they think prosperity gospel means you know, a guy who's sort of a little sleazy in a suit, has a jet, you know, promises that you'll get blessed if you give him your, you know, seed money for future blessings. Um, And that's definitely a version of the prosperity gospel. But there's another version that's pretty distinctly American Christian that says, if I work hard, if I 
do the right things, if I make the right choices, I will have a successful life. And of course, God wants that for me. But honestly, I'm not even really expecting you know that prosperous future to come from God. Maybe I'm relying on the free market or um, you know science. Maybe I think if I make all the right healthy choices, I'll never get sick. I'll never have you know some debilitating condition that really affects my life as long as I do the right things. And we tend to see other people who are in positions of poverty or illness and on some level think that they did something to get themselves there, especially when it comes to poverty. Um, and so that's a gospel that is really um, subversive or not subversive. It's sort of uh, we're susceptible to it, but it's sort of running underneath the surface. We don't often realize that we have bought into it. And then the second one, patriotism, again, is one that I think we're all very aware. Americans can be very patriotic, but I think we miss the way that we have kind of, especially as Christians, bound up our identity as Christians with our identity as Americans to the point where even as we are witnessing to other people in other cultures, it's really hard for us to untangle what we are sharing with other people that is truly Christian and what if it is just an American way of life, American values that we have sort of seen as synonymous with Christianity. Mm. Um, And again, that doesn't just happen because we sat down one day and decided we wanted to be super patriotic Christians. It happens because of things like the national anthem at football games, because of things like, you know, American flags in our sanctuaries, because of the 4th of July as sort of this like ritual that we go through every year. And we learn certain stories about the inherent goodness of our country and the Christian founding of it and things that really make us think there won't ever be any conflict between being a Christian and being an American, and there will for everyone of any country. Um, and so our, our inability to separate those identities becomes a form of a, a gospel. And then the third one, security, this is the one I think has typically surprised people the most, but just that we have this sense, similar to the prosperity gospel, that if I make all the right choices, if I do all the right things, I will be safe. And that is the ultimate good, too. Um, to be secure, to be safe. And that is a good. It's good for humans to be physically secure. It's good for us not to be harmed by others or to be in vulnerable positions. And yet we have made security or safety the highest good very often, especially in our churches. Um, And so very similar to the prosperity gospel, we'll do things like, well, if you put yourself in that kind of situation, what did you expect to happen? (laughs) You know, it's always the fault of the person who made the wrong choices that they have caused themselves to be insecure. Um, And it means that we will prioritize security over being sacrificially faithful to what God has called us to do. Um, Missions is that thing for really, you know, bold people to go out and do, but I'm not going to go to the neighborhood across the street that looks a little sketchy to me. I'm not even going to make myself vulnerable socially to kind of reach out to other people who aren't like me. If safety and security is the highest good of our churches, we will really miss out on some fundamental things of the Great Commission. And then the last one, um, supremacy, it fits better to just say supremacy, but in the chapter, it's really white supremacy, again, because it's distinct to America and American Christians. And really heartbreakingly, the church in America has a long history of being segregated across racial lines, um, as well as class lines, but racial lines really significantly. And so the reason I want to talk about that as a gospel is because similar to these other stories, none of those things I've just described are things that I think most Christians would say, if you sat down and had them write a doctrinal statement of all the things they believed, hopefully none of us would say security is the highest good, or I think white people are better than other people, or, you know, I think patriotism is the highest thing for us to, you know, we wouldn't say any of those things. And yet we often live as if those things are true because the stories have warmed their way into our hearts. And so for a lot of people who've grown up in churches where everyone looked like them and, uh, you know, it was in affluent white neighborhoods, the churches that I grew up in were at least, There are certain biases and prejudices that will just seep into the way that we view the world. And that's true of all Americans. But the reason that it operates as a gospel is because of the way that it has infected the American church as well. The way that our churches have not been the kind of, we haven't had the ability to confront those kinds of racist systems in our culture in the way that the church, if it was operating at its most healthy and faithful, would be able to do. And so the heart of that last gospel is really just to say we should be reflecting very carefully and faithfully and with the help of people who are not like us upon the way that our church has participated in those things. And are there ways that we could operate in our worship and our practice and our engagement with our community that could make us more faithful to be able to confront the things that the rest of the world is struggling with as well? Yeah, that was excellent. That was excellent. Um, And I think you even said in your chapter, talking about how when we look around and we, we see um, the same demographic and we see the same skin color and we see 
all of the very, we, you know, we think it's unity in the church when it really could be segregation and a form of it that we're just completely oblivious to. Uh, again, not, not yeah. knowing, you know, if we don't realize what it could be, we're, we're always comparing and contrasting Jesus's vision of the kingdom mm. with what we are currently experiencing. And, um, yeah. and, you know, you had referenced revelation and so many times in revelation, it talks about a kingdom of priests from every tribe and language and people and nation. And it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it isn't just, or you, you said somewhere in here, I, I kind of thought it was really funny. I can't remember where, but you said it would be, would be a surprise for people to realize that that there aren't like white Americans spoken about in the Bible anywhere or something. Right. That, I think that was in your book. I'm trying to make sure yeah. I, I read it. Here. And it's just, you know, you weren't being um, derogatory or anything like that, but it's just, oh yeah, wait a minute. That's, that's me. So, I mean, how, mm -hmm. how would I imagine a world where, yeah, Jesus is a brown skinned guy. Like he's not mm -hmm. you know, doesn't look like me or think or, or act exactly like me. Um, well, and really in, in the heart then, like I know you set this up, um, but the heart of your book really focused in on the church itself and the practices mm -hmm. um, that the church engages in. And, you know, even your word liturgy, um, I, I grew up as a, as a Baptist and actually became, became Anglican after seminary. And I was drawn to the liturgy, mm. I was drawn to sacramental ways yeah. of thinking, my reading of the Bible um, just lended itself to a much stronger, well, I was reading N.T. Wright and Christopher Wright and C.S. Lewis. And my wife finally came to me one day and she said, all the guys that you like to read are Anglican. Maybe there's a reason for that. <laughs> so, but you, you know, you spoke a lot about the sacraments and what, what is really being communicated in baptism and in the Lord's Supper. And again, approaching the nature of the church with a realization of what is the kingdom and what mm -hmm. is this actually calling us to, um, to embrace in for the sake of the kingdom or maybe to reject for the sake of the mm -hmm. kingdom. And so Caitlin, for me, I'm I, as a pastor, I'm always, I'm in a church and I, and I deal with all sorts of different peoples. Some are open to hearing these things be challenged and are eager to learn what Jesus has for them. Others don't, don't want to admit maybe that the patriotic gospel mm -hmm. has a hold of their heart a little bit stronger than it does. And so I don't just read books like yours for my intellectual stimulation, although I, I was intellectually stimulated by reading it, but I'm always <laughs> thinking, what is this going to look like on the ground? And um, yeah. how is this going to work itself out? And so, so I guess a question I have for you, um, how have your, how have your, how has your family, how has your church growing up, um, you know, how have they received some of the things that you're now saying? I mean, you know, some, some people are funny about that. They're not sure they, they like these mm -hmm. kinds of conversations. So how have you been able to navigate? Um, Cause I'm sure that's been probably exciting. Like you shared at Dallas, but it was probably discouraging at Liberty based on what I know mm -hmm. of Liberty university. So could you just, I mean, kind of, this might be more autobiographical, but how have you been able, like what has been the response um, from people that know you? Yeah, so I'm I'm really thankful. Um, I can't say it enough that my parents and my sisters, so like my immediate nuclear family growing up, we have really, I think all four of us, um, and now my sister's husband, really been going through a lot of this journey together. Um, I'm really thankful that unlike a lot of my peers, I haven't had the experience of politics becoming this really intense divide between myself and my parents, especially because of the generational difference. Um, there, we still have conflict. <laughs> we still don't agree on everything. Um, but I, I really cannot express enough how thankful I am, um, to God because it's, you know, none of our own work that my parents are so supportive and that their minds have been changed about a lot of things as my mind has been changed. And, um, 
I keep telling people recently they're at a new church, you know, they're, my dad's still in the military, so they move all the time and just moved to a new place and started going to a new church. And I love their church. And there's so many things their church is doing that I'm like, oh, you love this too. And and I don't want to take too much credit for it, but like I read, you read my book and I feel like there's a lot that's happening at this church that's, you know, consistent with that. And I that's just awesome. am so thrilled um, that that hasn't been a source of conflict. Um and the same has been true with a lot of, you know, with people at Dallas. I have, you know, so many dear friends and professors that have played a big part in this that have been so supportive. Um, but I will be honest, the the church response has been really hard. Um, I went through a really hard few months at the end of last year with my church um, because of the book and and because of some other, you know, related political things. And I'm really thankful that I went through all of that. Um, it was really painful at the time, um, involved a lot of people responding really strongly and in their strong response, um, acting in ways I never expected them to act, to be totally honest. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm really thankful coming out of that now that I got a, like a front row seat, um, to how strong of a hold politics really has on so many of us, yeah. um, and myself included. I'm not immune, obviously, to that, but I just, I had a really strong experience of watching it happen. And I think it's one of those things, it's kind of like how they say, you know, I'm in my last preaching class this semester, and you always joke that, like, you know, whatever text you get assigned in class, like, that's going to just be so exactly what you need at the time. Like, there's going to be something going on in your life, some weird thing that perfectly aligns with the message you need to give. I kind of feel like the book has been like that for me of, you know, I wrote a book that I said, hey, this is how strongly politics impacts us. This is the hold it has in our spiritual lives. And yet I did not believe that as much as I did until after it came out. <laughs> and I watched wow. it happen in my own life in a really visceral way. And that's not, it's not like a fun, oh, I was right, <laughs> because that's not fun. Yep. Um, but it was confirming in the sense that I survived that <laughs> um, and I learned so much about, about some of the truth of those things um, and then also just about ways I want to in the future continue to better communicate to people, better uh, enter into difficult conversations. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful that I learned a lot. And to be honest, I'm thankful that at the end of all of that, I can truthfully say like it's worth it to be as faithful and honest as you possibly can, to tell the truth even when it will cost you, and not to, you know, turn yourself into a martyr or die on every hill or try to, you know, just make a big fuss out of everything and cause a fight. But it did really impress upon me the reality that for the rest of my life, I can look back on that really hard few months and think, you survived that. God was faithful in that. And you learned that it still is worth it, that it can cost you a lot and it will still be worth it. Um, it doesn't mean you were right in everything you said. I, I am certain I will look back on the book, maybe even right now, <laughs> you know, coming up on a year out of it, um, maybe definitely in the years to come. I know I will look back on it and find things that I'm like, oh, I don't think that anymore. Or I wish I had said that differently. Um, so it's nothing to do with my being like perfect in this, but it was a, it was a really personal, embodied, in my own life reminder of the cost of doing it is real and the cost is worth it. Yeah. Well, I'm really thankful for you just sharing openly with us about that. That's, that's just such a, I love people's personal experiences and the stories that they share because this book is a reflection of you. And like you said, it's, it's mm -hmm. a reflection of you at the time that you wrote it. So it isn't because like mm -hmm. you said, as, as time goes on there, Oh, should I have said that? Should I not? Um, now, just curiously, by by way of personality and or maturity, um, how do are you a confrontational kind of person, or have you really learned this like in the last several months? Mm. So it's funny. I, <laughs> like I said earlier, I was a debater in college, and so in college, it really I had become quite confrontational. <laughs> Okay. My family will tell you not flattering stories about me coming home from college and just being like ready to fight everyone because I had learned how to do it really well. And to be honest, it's not a positive thing. I had learned how to win every argument. Like I, I would be happy to get into a fight about politics with my dad uh, or my sister or my mom because I was good at it and I, I could kind of 
corner you and I was good at thinking on my feet and so people could get confused, you know, and that was like a good feeling. Hmm. And that's terrible. All of that is horrible. <laughs> um, and I think part of what happened at the end of college, the short version of what I said was a long story about how I decided not to go to law school and instead to go to seminary was that I I really kind of had like a come to Jesus moment, um, ironically and kind of stereotypically at a Christian summer camp <laughs> where I was volunteering and working with middle school girls. And I just really realized I have been consumed with becoming successful um, in debate and in my career and in school. And I have become really destructive. This skill that you could use for good or for bad, unsurprisingly, a broken, fallen human heart is going to twist it into something bad. And it had become something bad for me. And so I kind of thought, okay, I'm going to seminary. I'm completely done with all of that. <laughs> like, I'm not going to do anything that could tempt me to seek success. I'm not going to do anything that would, you know, let me use these skills. And then, of course, because these skills that can be used for bad are also you know, gifts that God has given me to be able to have conversations, how to articulate myself well, um, found another outlet to be used again. And so on one level, I can be confrontational, but on another level, I'm really thankful I went through that experience in college and then came to start working at a church in Dallas, worked at the same church for five years here, where it was very different from me politically, very different from me kind of just temperamentally. There were some generational divides right off the bat when I got there that I kind of stepped into. And so it put me really quiet <laughs> for a long time and taught me how to be really careful and reasoned with when I was going to say what I was going to say. Um, and so I'm thankful I had that sort of trajectory of like being formed. Again, that's like always how I'm going to talk about it. I was in an environment for years in college where I was formed into a pretty confrontational um, pretty not emotionally intelligent <laughs> kind of person. Mm. And then God really shaped the rest of, of my time in college and shaped my time in seminary. And I do think also just, I took a ton of spiritual formation classes, my very beginning of seminary. And so much of that, the emphasis I got from that was you can't argue <laughs> your way into getting people to agree with you, especially when it comes to these kinds of heart capturing issues like politics and like faith, um, like theological disagreements and things like that. And so a lot of what I came out of those classes with was I need to learn how to better get at the root of the problem when there's a disagreement politically, when there's a disagreement theologically. And a lot of times the root of the problem is the desires that people have, the fears they have, it's feelings and feelings are not bad, but we too often, at least in the context that I grew up in, too often dismissed them for rational arguments. And if we stay logical and rational, then we can argue people into the right positions on things. And so a lot of my disposition now has changed into, I don't want to shy away from a confrontation, but I do want to do it in a way in which I am attuned to inevitably how emotional um, all of these things are. And not I don't say that in a negative way. I say it in a way of just, we are humans that have emotions and we are drawn by the things that we love. And so how can I engage in conversations that are hard in a way that is, is willing to enter into conflict, but in a way that is not interested in just sort of winning for myself. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. That's really good. And, and I would like to tell you that my observation, um, having listened to you um, talk on um, the Holy Post podcast and having read your book, is that you have, um, you have a prophetic gift, I believe. Um, mm. You have an ability to say, I, I think dispassionately is the right word. Like you, you mm. are passionate, but you're able to like step out of it enough to say, no, I think I can, I can paint a picture of what's really going on here. Mm. So you, you cited the prophets themselves, particularly Jeremiah several times in your book, <laughs> but I see you there and I see you. Um, I mean, I'm very excited to kind of just follow where Jesus takes you over the next several years and decades mm. and stuff, because I think, I think your voice is a needed voice. And I think your voice is going to be really, really important for the church. And, um, I'm, it, it sounds funny this way. I'm, I'm definitely older than you and, and I'm, I'm almost looking toward you to, to be like, how do I learn how to speak lovingly and kindly, but boldly at the same time. And I, mm -hmm. I am by, by personality, by design, I am a pretty strong feeler. 
So I, I tend to tip the scales either by getting really upset really quickly or um, mm-hmm. shut down and withdraw. And so, Ian, that's just, mm. I mean, that's that human nature, right? But I, I'm trying to learn yeah. how to do it and, and remain present, remain focused on the concerns of the kingdom. But I'm, I'm taking a lot of cues from you and I'm very thankful mm. for what you've learned, even your vulnerability here on this, on this conversation, just to say, yeah, I've had a lot of skills and some of them were not good skills <laughs> or they were good <laughs> skills, but you know, the way we can use things, um, mm-hmm. to, to bolster our own view, which, yeah, that's, uh, come to Jesus moments are really special in everybody's life. Um, yeah, well, um, I, I know we're, thank we're, you for saying that. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, you're very welcome. And I hope you re- that's so encouraging. I hope you receive lots of encouragement like that. Um, Oh, I did want to want to ask. I know this. Maybe you get tired of hearing this, but I am just curious. How did you meet Phil Vischer, and how did you end up as like a extension <laughs> of the Holy Post podcast? That's just. I'm just totally curious about that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was supposed to answer that earlier, and I didn't. Well, that's um, yeah, I <laughs> honestly having an interview on the Holy Post for my book was like a dream. But And I don't even really know how exactly it happened. Phil messaged me on Twitter. So we first were Twitter friends, I guess, and then asked me to come on and do the interview for the book. And I had so much fun with it. It was so great. He's great. And then afterwards, I think he might have, even at the end of our conversation, we'd finished recording. And he was like, you know, a lot of authors are just authors. Like, they're not good talkers. And you, you're you're a pretty good talker. Do you want to just like keep coming on? And I was like, sure, I'd love to. Oh my goodness. That is great. Oh, wow. <laughs> They're not always good so. talkers. Well, you are a good talker. So that's, that's, that's excellent. <laughs> that's really excellent. And I'm scratching my head. It, it, I, I, I'm 90% sure this was you. So I'm going to tell you this. And if it wasn't you, you can forget it. But I, um, <laughs> You had made a comment or Phil had asked a question or something and, and, or maybe Sky had made it, made a question about what churches could do or what pastors could do. And I think it was you who said, I think what pastors need to do for their churches is they need to teach their people the story. They need to teach their churches. They need Mm -hmm. to go back to the beginning of the Bible and they need to teach their people Genesis one, Genesis two, and work their way through the story because we're, we've been captured by so many other narratives that the antidote yeah. is the biblical narrative. And if that was you, I want to thank you for that because that, <laughs> that was, I have been trying to do that in my church for, mm. and I, I'm, I, I actually, that's what I do on my own podcast is I'm trying to reteach yeah. the biblical narrative from the beginning. If Jesus is reshaping our understanding of ultimate reality, but I had not had someone, I was in a particularly vulnerable point just in my own life and ministry when I heard you mm-hmm. say that, but I went home, told my wife, like, this is what this girl said, like this, that was, it was just such a <laughs> of encouragement because I thought, okay, here's someone else who. You, you have insights, Caitlin, you really do. And so when I heard you say, this is what pastors need to be doing. And I thought, oh, well, here's at least one area of something that I am trying to do that I hope is going to take us in a positive direction. So thank you. Thank you for that. That was an encouragement. I'm so glad. I don't remember saying that, but it sounds very much like something I would say. So I probably did. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. I'm sure you don't remember everything you've said, and I can't even tell you what episode that was. So <laughs> Anyways, well, I'm so glad to hear that that's that that's what you're doing, and that that was encouraging to you. Because yeah, I I think sometimes we overcomplicate the solutions. That was really what I hoped some people got from the book too. It was just like, yeah, this is a really hard problem, and maybe we don't need a new strategy or a new Sunday school class or a new curriculum. Maybe we just need to make sure that we're actually practicing the traditions and and preaching scripture correctly. And we're doing the things that the church has always done in a way that does what it's supposed to do, which is confront the idols and the false gospels of whatever context we find ourselves in. And maybe overcomplicating the question is, is distracting us from just doing the thing we're supposed to be doing. That's right. Yeah. We can talk about it forever. And if we don't actually um, step out and do it and engage our communities in a healthy way, then Mm -hmm. yeah, that's not gonna, that's not gonna take us anywhere. Um, 
Well, Caitlin, we're just about out of time, but if, if some of our, I'll put a link in the show notes of this episode, when I publish it, I'll put a link to your book. Um, if people want to find you, are you a uh, social media presence? Where would they, where would they go to kind of follow your work? Yeah, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. I'm more of a words person than a picture person. So I'm on Twitter quite a bit. <laughs> okay. Yep. And just at Caitlin, Caitlin Shess. At Caitlin Shess. Yep. Caitlin Shess. Okay. That's wonderful. Well, this has been really great. Again, the uh, the liturgy of politics, spiritual formation for the sake of our neighbor. And um, it's been a real, real joy to spend the last 45 minutes talking to you, Caitlin. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I hope you have a fantastic week and um, I will give you a notification when I publish this episode. So thanks great. so much, Caitlin. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Just to let you know, if you would like to follow Caitlin, um, I will go ahead and put in the show notes links to her um, blog, which actually is also found on her website. And so you can find her there. Also, at Caitlin Shess is the way to locate her on Twitter and or on Instagram, and you can find her in those ways. I'll make links to both of those as well. So thank you so much for tuning into this by the book episode, The Liturgy of Politics. Again, thanks to Caitlin for a great conversation. And for those of you continuing to listen to the podcast, tune in again for another episode coming up soon. Hope you all have a great week.